Perhaps the most revolutionary development of recent years has been that of the computer. Because for the first time, we've discovered a machine that can substitute, at least in part, for the human brain. Before that, it was just a matter of saving human muscles, of using machinery to spare what human muscles couldn't do very well. And computers come in all sizes because they've been getting smaller and smaller. We've got these tiny little microchips now. And as a result, every industry, the government itself, tax collecting agencies, Airplanes, everything depends on computers. We have personal computers in the home. And they are constantly getting better, cheaper, more versatile, capable of doing more things. So that we can look into a future when for the first time, humanity in general will be freed of all kinds of work that's really an insult to the complex human brain that requires no great thought no great creativity. Leave all that to the computer, and we can leave to ourselves those things the computers can't do, such things as imagination, creativity, fantasy, intuition, problem solving, where we don't have to have the exact conditions and know exactly what's happening. We have an intuitive feel for what the solution ought to be. No computer can do that. And we can save our own brains for that purpose. Artificial intelligence is a phrase that we use for any device that does things which in the past we have associated only with human intelligence. For instance, if you have a machine that can alphabetize cards very rapidly, until recently only human beings could alphabetize cards, in that case you've got an example of artificial intelligence. But this does not necessarily mean that something that is artificially intelligent thinks, quote unquote, precisely as a human being does. It may be a completely different kind of intelligence. The machines may specialize in certain, quote, mental activities, while human beings specialize in others. We do a great many things we're not good at. For instance, we're not really good at arithmetic. We need help. We need numbers, we need pen and paper, we need devices. Well, the cheapest computer in the world can multiply and divide faster and more accurately than we can. That's its specialty. Our specialty is different things. So that you end up not having artificial intelligence and natural intelligence identical, but two different things, two different specializations. They work together. Each supplies the lack of the other. And in cooperation, they can advance far more rapidly than either could by itself. Furthermore, computers are not just immobile things, because you can hook computers up to machinery and have the machines that spare human muscles also act in such a way, in such a versatile way, that they seem to be thinking. You have artificial intelligence applied to machines, and we call them robots. In science fiction, you always think of robots as man-like, metallic creatures. But actually, any machine that's computerized is a robot. And we have industrial robots right now that don't look the least bit like human beings, and yet that do things that until just a couple of decades ago, only human beings could do. And we're going to live in a future, perhaps, in which we will have personal robots as well. Robots that do look like human beings and that replace, for the first time, what we used to call servants and free us all. For the first time, we're going to be free, really, truly free, humanity as a whole. Now again, what's life going to be like? if we are completely computerized and completely robotized, what are the side effects? Will there be difficulties? Undoubtedly. Will there be things that we won't like? Undoubtedly. But we've got to think about it now so as to be prepared for possible unpleasantness and try to guard against it before it's too late. We always have to do that. It's like in the old days when the automobile was invented. 
would have been so much better if we had built our cities with the automobile in mind instead of building cities for a pre-automobile age and finding we can hardly find any place to put the automobiles or to allow them to drive. This is the sort of thing that we must avoid in the future. It's impossible to predict what they will be. That's one of the great excitements of science, that always there is the unexpected. Always there is something that no one thought of that completely revolutionizes our thoughts in this direction or that. It's a, a kind of excitement that keeps scientists going, I assure you. And if the population generally can be made to share in it, how much pleasure they will have. And again, we have no way of knowing how that will help us in our own technology. I mean, when we discovered the electron in 1895, it seemed to be just a scientific curiosity, a tiny little particle that was inside atoms and nobody cared except a few scientists. Except that out of it grew the great electronics industry. Without the electron, we wouldn't have radio, we wouldn't have television, we wouldn't have recording devices, we wouldn't have almost anything we now have and take for granted. And we don't know what further discoveries may tell us not only about the universe, but uh, about our own technology.